Good? 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 All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Right before lunch, as I mentioned, there's free food after the, there's some of you probably already got the free food already. Um, but, uh, thank you very much for, to coming, uh, for coming to my talk on imposter syndrome. But before we get into the actual content of the, of the talk, I want to just ask you about this person. All right. Albert Einstein. Do we know him? I mean, I guarantee you 95% or more of you know who that person is, right? Uh, would you, just by a raise of hand, say that he is an expert in his field? Or was an expert in his field? Yeah, okay. Pretty smart dude, as far as any comparison goes. And this guy is the iconic version of what a physicist is, right? If you look up physicist on Wikipedia, as we do, his picture shows up there. All right, right, so this is, wow, that zoomed in something that wasn't supposed to happen. Let's go back. All right, so his picture shows up. And yet, Albert Einstein thought that people were making too much of his work. He thought that people were taking what he made, his simple ideas, his formulae, his, his, his ideas, and they were blowing it up, and it made him feel like a fraud. It made him feel like an imposter. Now, I just was out at RSA, and I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson speak. Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, astrophysicist extraordinaire. He's an amazing guy. He, he talked a little bit about some of the things that Einstein, this guy who doesn't feel like he really contributed that much to the world that we live in, talked to us a little bit about some of the things that Einstein predicted or worked out the math for 50 or 60 years before we could prove. But regardless of what objectively we know about Einstein, we know that he felt like a fraud. We know that he couldn't internalize the feelings of success that the public, that his peers, and that other people were showering upon him. He just didn't feel it. The reason? was that his subjective perception of what the real world events were, what his contri contributions were to society were, were not reflected in what, or the objective view, I'm sorry, he didn't have an objective view of what his contributions were. Okay? So, objectively, people would say, that's amazing stuff, that's, that's decades ahead. And yet, when he heard the words, when he heard the accolades, when he heard things about his success, he couldn't attribute that success to him personally, to his brain, to what he built. This is imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome hit me really hard in 2012 at DerbyCon. Anybody go to DerbyCon 2012? Yes, some hands. Yeah, I remember it really distinctly. There were some amazing talks at, at DerbyCon 2012. Uh, people like uh, Colonel Onage, Chris Gates, who is here, Rob Fuller, H.D. Uh, Moore, some, some powerhouses in information security. They were up there talking about these neat, neat whiz-bang things that they've created, research to scan the whole internet in, in days. I was walking back to my hotel because I, I stayed at the Econo Lodge nearby. And I was walking back to the hotel thinking about all these things. And I was like, wow, that was really cool. And I started thinking about, you know, what are my contributions to information security? You know, if, if I was to get up there, what, what would people say about me? Would people even walk back from my talk and go, wow, you know, let me think about that? Because you know what? At that time, I had no O-Day exploits to write a, the PowerShell module about or, or to write, write and incorporate into Metasploit. I couldn't even write PowerShell or Python or Ruby or Perl. Well, Perl, you know, Perl's, Perl's easier to write. Um, but I couldn't do any of that stuff. And so I started thinking about myself. I was like, well, what am I good at? What could I do? Well, I just test web apps. I just test web apps. Now, I teach how to hack web applications now. I teach for SANS Institute. Some of you might have heard of it. I teach that. But back in 2012, I didn't think that that was really anything to compare with what Chris Gates and Rob Fuller and H.D. Moore did. And so I went home, and after analyzing what I personally was doing to contribute to information security, um, I went and started looking for other jobs outside of the field. 
Now at this point, I had been in information security for about uh, 10 years, okay? Hacking, defending, incident responding, doing all those things that I loved doing. And I did love doing them. But when I started comparing myself to other people and ignoring the successes that I had personally, my contributions were insignificant. And so I looked for other work. And as I was looking for other work, I listened to podcasts because you know, I was, I was kind of bored with what I was doing after hours. And I listened to a podcast and I, I remember I was just you know, in the background and I heard these two words, imposter syndrome. Wow. Oh. Well, I know what imposter is. I know what syndrome is. Putting them together, that, that sounds like something that might be interesting. And that's when I started learning about imposter syndrome. Because things started to make sense. The behaviors that I found people with imposter syndrome have, I saw myself. And it explained a lot of the activities. It explained a lot of how I related to the world and how I interpreted the world. The first thing about imposter syndrome is it's not a syndrome. It's not recognized by the American Psychological Association or any other uh, psychologist-related mental health organization as an actual syndrome. What you'll hear, what you'll see, if you Google it or DuckDuckGo it or whatever, you'll see imposter phenomenon and imposter feelings because that gets to the heart of what this really is. It's, it's your feelings about your success, your feelings about how you are interpreting the world. The premier study, the study that kicked off everything about imposter syndrome was made in 1978 by Dr. Imes and Dr. Clancy. And they studied about a hundred women at a university. And they asked them questions about their success. They, they took metrics about, about where they were in their career, what information they knew. And at that point, they hypothesized, you know, that, that their study was only on women, but men can probably do this. But if you remember back to 1978, it was a different time for women in the workplace, in the family, in our culture. And so, they focused on women. And what we're finding is that these types of, of behaviors that we're going to be talking about can happen to anybody. And the behaviors are, range anywhere from psychological type of disorders like depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, inability to connect with people, lack of confidence, avoiding work, problems in the workplace, problems at home, these are the types of psychological manifestations that sometimes people do go to counselors and they seek help for. They, they say, hey, I'm feeling depressed. And when you work back to why, sometimes it's the imposter feelings that are the cause of it. In fact, one of the things that I found out in doing the research for this is that approximately 70% of people, which means that some of you probably in the audience or that are listening at home, probably have had imposter feelings at some point in your life. Now, imposter feelings are not overwhelming. They don't drive everything that you do necessarily, but they can, just like any type of disorder or any type of feelings. They can be, come and go. They can be something that you experience once and you're like, huh, whatever, and you move on. Or they can be pervasive and debilitating. In fact, and you, you called it, Chris. Uh, in fact, when I was creating this talk, I was like, I'm going to do a talk on imposter syndrome. This is going to be really cool, right? Because I'm going to learn about imposter syndrome and everything. And then, and then I started thinking to myself, well, who, who am I to actually give a talk on imposter syndrome? <laughs> like, oh no, what's happening? Yeah. So imposter syndrome affects or can affect everybody, right? Young and old, uh, any gender. Uh, race, religion, it doesn't matter because it's how you interpret events. It does come during certain times, though, uh, in places where you have pressure to achieve. You're, you're placed in an environment where you have to win. You have to succeed. Posture feelings are sometimes manifested. In fact, it also shows up when you're surrounded by high achievers. When I talk about those, those talks by H.D. Moore, has anybody heard H.D. Moore speak? Dude is deep and fast, and he, he just talks about stuff like everybody else is on the same level. It boggles the mind. And here I am comparing myself to him. 
in a different discipline. For those of you that were here just in the last talk, uh, the lady, Samantha, she was speaking about um, software-defined radio, something I know nothing about. And yet she was going deep into it, what I consider deep, talking about bits and ones and zeros and offsets, and it was blowing my mind because I didn't know that stuff. And if that's who I'm comparing myself to, then my perception of my success is going to be different. It also manifests itself when we're talking about moving into a new area. Let's say you just got a promotion at work. You are now the lead of something, or you're moving from incident response to forensics, or you're moving from somewhere else where your body, your base of knowledge needs to grow. You have to learn some new things in order to take, uh, take on the new responsibility. Those areas are where imposter feelings will sometimes manifest because you feel, oh my God, what if, what if they find out I really don't know about how to code or I don't know how to attack this or, or manage people? Um, then here's my personal favorite, negative self-talk. Now, you might think because I'm standing up here, I'm an extrovert. I love talking to people. I love working with people. But honestly, I'm kind of an extroverted introvert. People scare me. I can talk in front of audiences, no problem. I can teach classes for SANS or give WebExes, no problem. But talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, that's really hard for me. Because what I'll do is I'll talk to people, and then I will go back home. And I will think about it on the drive home. I will think about it on the way to bed. I will think about it during dinner. I was like, well, oh my god, I used the word but too many times in my talk. Did I say um when I was talking about that? Ooh, what do they think of I have this negative self-talk that just keeps chattering inside my head. And that negative self-talk reinforces those feelings that I have, and that some of you might have. Now, I work with an organization called Nova Hackers, uh, local here. I see some of you in the audience, all right? One of the things that we do at Nova Hackers, and we do in our workplace, I work for Booz Allen Hamilton, who's a sponsor here. and. Uh, one of the things that we do in those organizations is we encourage our younger people to stand up, to talk about something that they know. And overwhelmingly, if you've tried to get a younger person to speak about something or somebody new to the industry to talk, what do you hear? Oh, I don't know anything that other people don't know. Everybody knows exactly what I know. And that's really what's shown on the left. People with imposter feelings or moving into a new area or that are unsure of themselves lack self-confidence. We'll, we'll figure out that, hey, you know what? You've been in the, area, in, in the industry for 20 years. You have to know about SDR. You have to know everything that I know. In reality, much more like the diagram on the left, on the right, where each of us knows pieces of what everybody else knows. Some of us know some things more deeply, and some of us know other things more deeply. And these organizations like Nova Hackers and Tool and other places. They are organizations where people share their knowledge. We have this concept of an imp imposter syndrome cycle, okay? And the imposter syndrome cycle is one that is quite simple to describe. If we start in the lower left, shit, I have a new project to do. Oh no. And then you go up to the top. The project is going to be in a disaster. This is that negative self-talk. This is that lack of self-confidence in your skills. This is your comparing yourself to other people and going, how the hell can I make something that, that these people don't know about? Well, somehow you muddle through it. Somehow you, you get it done. And you're like, hey, I did it. Whew. Oh crap, I've got another project to do, and this cycle keeps going. Now this is the simplified version. Uh, in one of the papers that I was reviewing for this talk, I found a more complicated one. And this, I think, hits at some very important pieces of imposter syndrome. If we start at the top, again, we have that shit, i got a project to do, right? The achievement-related tasks. From the achievement-related task, there's going to be some anxiety. There's going to be some some type of self-doubt, some worrying, some some anxiety inside that you that you have to create something that nobody else has done. That you're going to be teaching people that are experts. How many of you have PhDs in psychology? Yeah, when I was making this talk, I was like, oh, what if there's a PhD in psychology out there? They're going to say I'm wrong. This is those types of things I think about. So you have this anxiety, you have this self-doubt, this worry, but somehow. 
You manage to get the project done, right? You maybe will over-prepare for it. You will work really, really hard. This is the perfectionist syndrome, right? The, I will put hours and hours. Do you know how long it took me to decide on what font to put on these slides? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Because I was worried. There's, oh, well, what if it's not reader? What if it, it's not big enough? Or, or and there's not enough space in between. So I over-prepared. As I do. How many of you have heard of those people that create talks and they're like, oh, it, my talk's in five minutes. Yeah, I'm just finishing up the slides, right? I'm just, yeah. That's a common thing at these conferences. Uh, you, you see somebody in the back putting the last memes on their slides or whatever. Um, so we also have this procrastination thing, which I'm great at. I'm a master of procrastination. I know all the tricks. But you know what? Through my over-preparing, through my procrastination, somehow I get the work done. Now, what happens is I stand up here in front of all you and I talk about imposter syndrome. And then afterwards, somebody will come out and say, hey, great talk. I really learned something about it. And I get that success. I got that, hey, I reached one person. That, that was helpful. And I'm happy. The problem is that with that positive feedback, I don't attribute it to me making this talk, standing in front of you, learn, and helping you learn about imposter feelings. I will say, well, oh, that was, uh, that was because I overprepared. That was because I, I worked really hard on making sure that font is good. And, and so next time, I have to work even harder to make sure that everything's working right. Or I'll say, well, you know, I just kind of threw it together at the last minute. I'm glad something resonated with you. And this is what I think. And I'll attribute it to luck. Now, because I've deferred that success, what happens is the next time that I go to write a talk or give a speech or, or do something, I don't have that internalized, hey, I did pretty well in that last talk. Let me just amplify that. I look at this, I'm like, well, what could I make better? What could I do better? Because because I have to make this version and this next version even better. And that then starts the achievement and related tasks. And you get it. See, the thing with imposter syndrome or imposter feelings is that you both have a fear of success and a fear of failure. We cover both sides of that issue. Fear of success because that success won't be mine, it won't be earned. And a fear of failure because if I didn't try hard enough, then I failed. Now, for those of you that have heard my other talks, you know that you have to fail to succeed. You have to fail to learn. No, you don't learn to fail. Wait, is it fail to learn or learn to fail? Yeah, you have to fail to be able to learn because that's how we grow, by doing things wrong, right? I mean, who was it that said, hey, I didn't, oh, Edison, I think, said that, I'll just, I'll just say it's Edison. Um, Edison said that, uh, you know, hey, I didn't find 1,200 ways not to make this work. I found 12, oh, what did he say? What was the other way around? Yeah. So, I'm failing! It is Edison. There you go. So, so Edison said, I didn't find one way to make this bulb work. I found 10,000 ways that it didn't work. Okay? So, you have to try. But because of imposter feelings, you might not. Because of that anxiety, because of that self-doubt, because of that worry. And you know what? You might also not try when there's public scrutiny. Uh, a publishing code to GitHub is something that people with imposter feelings dread because what if people think that my functions aren't named right? What if, what if, you know, I got the code wrong? So they won't do it. They won't give talks. They won't go out and put themselves out there. And that's okay because that's where they are. And at this point in the presentation, you might be asking yourself, hey, do I have imposter syndrome? Imposter feelings? And it boils down to two questions. One, do you feel like a fraud? Sometimes, in certain situations. And two, if you get honest feedback about your success, or about something good that you've done, can you internalize that and go, yeah, that makes me feel good, that was me. Or do you defer it? Oh, that was the team that did that. Or, oh, you know what, the slides basically wrote themselves. Of course, there's many more questions that you can ask if you want to get more technical. And if you do, there's an online test. I'll give you the short link. I'm not going to try to Rick roll you or anything or, or send you to malicious uh, sites. Um, there are lots of set, sites out there that have you know 20 or 30 question tests. And it's pretty easy to figure out if you have imposter feelings. But know this. In researching this, I just looked on Twitter for hashtag imposter syndrome. 
And I found out that there are a lot of people giving a lot of presentations about imposter syndrome and imposter feelings. So if you think that you are the only person that feels like a fraud, know that you're not alone. There's lots of people out there. But the problem is, is that people with imposter syndrome, they don't come out and go, I have imposter syndrome, ha-ha, join me. No, because we fear success and failure. Because if you know that I'm a fraud or I feel like I'm a fraud, then that reinforces those feelings. So people may feel like an imposter, they may feel like a fraud, but you're not going to necessarily know it. And I've talked to some very very senior, highly technical people about imposter feelings in order to make this talk. I was amazed that some of the people that I respected, some of the people that are industry leaders, and say, yeah, this is all the time. You know, I see this new thing, I'm like, well, why didn't I come up with that? You know, what am I doing here? And it blew my mind. So, just know that you're not the only one. But I'm here to tell you that you can work to overcome these feelings. Even if you get this once right before a big talk, or, or if you have this new job that you want to apply for, but you don't really feel like you are employable. You can work through these feelings. But keep in mind, this is changing your perception on reality. And it's going to take time. The first step is to realize, recognize the trigger feelings that, that, oh my God, I'm feeling anxious, or ooh, I have that talk to prepare for tomorrow. I'm going to go and play this video game or something. Recognize what you're doing and kind of why you might be doing it. Next thing is to talk about it. Now, you could choose to stand in front of a group of people that you've never met and talk about it, absolutely, or you could talk to yourself about it. Remember I talked to the, about that negative self-talk. Change that. Change your self-talk. Or just recognize, hey, these are imposter feelings that I'm having. I'm going to go ahead and work through it. Talk to a mentor, a friend, a spouse. Just getting it out there brings that demon out and says, hey, you know what? You don't have that much control over me anymore because I can name you. Talk to a professional. A lot of the research that I, that I saw online was for moderate to severe cases of imposter fraud and feelings, um, a professional, a counselor, psychologist, those are the people that will, will, you'll get the most help with. The next thing is to keep things in perspective. You know, take what you're hearing and keep it in perspective. You know, don't blow things up. And it's easy for me to say, don't blow things up. What will happen is, I will walk out of this room, we'll go get lunch, at lunch someone will be like, hey, that was a great talk. I might get two or three people, maybe somebody's tweeting it right now, but I'll get one comment about my font, and it will blow things out of proportion. I'm like, oh, my font, oh, the whole talk sucked. Yeah, you're doing that now. Thanks, janitor. Yeah, yeah. Security. So, try to keep things in perspective, all right? The next, track your progress. Track your achievements. On the wall of my office, if you see my other talks, I have this wall of badges. That's not just to show junior people, hey, these are all the cool things I've done, all the talks I've given, all the conferences I've been to, but it's also to reinforce to me that I've tried, I've done things, and it makes me feel good too. But the problem is that you have to own it. You have to go, hey, I gave those talks. I earned those badges. Next thing is avoid minimizing your, your, your speech. Okay? Take things out of it. When you say, yeah, I just gave a talk at B-Sides Nova, take that word just out of there because it takes your accomplishment and it reduces it to, yeah, something, you know, that's not a big a deal. Same thing with, yeah, I'm pretty sure the crowd liked it or it was kind of okay, it was kind of a hundred people in the audience. Take that stuff out of there because what that does is that keeps that reinforcing cycle of negative thoughts or minimizing your own accomplishments. Next, remember what you do well. I don't reverse engineer malware. That's just not what I do. I don't write O days or do other stuff like that. That's not what I do. But what I do, well, I, I pick locks pretty well. Okay. I test web applications pretty well. And those things can cement you when you're feeling like things are getting overwhelmed, when you feel like you know nothing's working, come back to what you know. Come back to what you're good at. And of course, Share it with others. Teach other people about that. Because when they start talking about you as a mentor, as a teacher, as something, as somebody that knows something, that kind of helps with the, 
hey, I remember when I taught those kids how to pick locks. Oh, uh, I mean, it was a it was a take your child to work day, and it was really fun, wasn't it? Was a, yeah. Um, also, realize that nobody's perfect. That was really hard for me. Everybody poops, right? Yeah. Nobody's perfect. H.D. Moore knows a ton about the world, but I bet he might not know anything about imposter syndrome. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't know something about how to play hearts or another card game. But not everybody is perfect. We put people on a pedestal, and then we, we, we attribute a lot of these factors to them of, of per perfectness. And then again, we need to fail to grow. Next, if you are a perfectionist or if you have perfectionist tendencies, work on something until it's 75%, 80%, well, until it's good enough. I was working on this talk until last night, late, because it needed some changes. You know, that picture of Einstein wasn't cropped right or whatever. And at a certain point, I'm like, all right, I'm done. Closed my laptop, went to bed. I thought about it while I was falling asleep, of course, but um, work until something is good enough. And then here, since our perception of reality is a little bit skewed, get objective feedback. Go to somebody that you work with. Go to somebody that you're friends with, that you trust their opinions, and say, hey, tell me, what are your thoughts about that font? Is that too big? Or whatever it is. Recognize that this is not going to happen overnight. If you are somebody that works with or imposter feelings, um, it's something that will probably be a challenge for you for a while. But there are tips and tricks. In fact, one of the biggest imposter feeling things that happened to me was when I was doing this is, you know, I just typed in imposter syndrome to YouTube. And I found um, Nicholas's 2014 Rails conference video. And I was watching it. I was going, oh my God, this is the exact video that I want to give. He gives the same numbers that I just researched. Oh my God, his font is better than mine. He's got a cool background. <laughs> so I encourage you to see his, his version of this talk. But um, he had some really neat thoughts in there, including the fact that he also suffers from or works with, deals with, imposter feelings. Now, Nicholas ended his talk by talking about um, how in, people with imposter feelings essentially will probably always feel like an imposter. But what they can do is they, be, they can become high-functioning imposters in their own minds. Seriously. I know it's kind of funny to say, but you know, that's kind of where I strive to, to work for, to be at, to become a high-functioning imposter. And with that, I'll give you some resources. That's a link that goes to my webreacher.com website, where I've got a whole bunch more resources, uh, the PDFs I referred to, the Ons and Clancy research, and... Uh, as well as some of these videos. So thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions? A free lunch outside. Any questions? Yes, sir. Okay. So, go ahead. is there a question, or do you just want to mention that? Yeah. 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 So what Corey mentions is that um, in the past, when you would go to, if you go to DefCon or you go to Black Hat or something, you see the rock stars, or you used to see a lot more of the rock stars giving the talks. And when you attended those events, you would attend, you would sit in the seats, and then you move to the next thing. You wouldn't participate. You wouldn't get to integrate and work with those people. Um, now what's happening is with, I think, one of the, the, the great things about having all these wonderful local community conferences is that it gives more people the opportunities to talk to a smaller crowd, to do things like, in, um, do things like panels and, and other things that bring those rock stars 
back down to earth and, and work with it to show that these people are just normal people as well. Um, as far as the striations, I'll get to your question in one second. As far as the striations of, of hey, you're just in IT, you're just, a, you're just a vulnerability assessment person, you're not a pen tester, and putting, doing that ranking, um, I think the industry as a whole has done a lot to dispel and break down a lot of those, those, uh, those myths that red team is all, are always the high profile people. Blue team, in, in fact, for those of you that are going to uh, B-Sides Charm up in Baltimore, um, Forgotten Run's a great conference that's kind of focused on defense and how defense is just that as important, if not more important. Thank you. Yes? Um, yeah. Absolutely, and the, and the comment was that essentially even bands like U2, who are now international, uh, we'll, we'll just we'll say galactical, um, not people, I'm not sure people know in those seven planets that they just found, I'm not sure they know about U2 yet, but um, in like 39 light years they will. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, everybody starts at a certain place, whether it's in a garage, whether it's at a B-Sides conference, um, or whatever, everybody starts somewhere, and you know, you can grow to be whatever you want to be. Yes, sir. Right. So what janitor says is that, you know, sometimes when experts are in the audience, recognized experts on a topic or something like that. I, I teach SANS classes, and one of the other instructors that I spoke to, um, he, was, he was really neat. He said, when I got up and I, I presented, when he presented this crypto part of the SSL and TLS handshakes, he was talking about it, and he turned to the audience and his class, and he's like, well, you know, what do you think about that? Any questions? And in this class was somebody that created one of the algorithms he was talking about. And he didn't know that. And the person raised their hand and goes, yeah, that was a pretty adequate discu uh, you know, discussion of the topic. And he's like, adequate? You know, what do you have to say? And the person was like, well, I, 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 that's my last name on the screen right there. Like, ah! So yeah, it can be overwhelming, but it's also uh, it's a two-way street, making yourself approachable. Other questions or comments? Anything? Uh, yes, sir. Do, the question is, does it get better, or worse, or the same? And it all depends upon, as you do more work and projects, it all depends on your perception. It really does. It's an individual thing. Um, I've given a, a bunch of talks at conferences, and it's still, uh, Jason is no longer here, uh, but one of the SANS marketing people was sitting in the audience, and he's always coming to me and going, hey, I need you to do a webcast. And I fear these things when people come and ask me to do talks because, oh my god, I have to create something new that nobody else has ever seen. So I still have problems with that stuff. But you, sir, you might be in a different place and might be able to say, you know, I, I've got the practice, I've got people that are listening or tweeting to me, um, and you know that, that becomes a successful reinforcer for you. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the comment is that is that many times the more senior that you get within an industry, within an area of knowledge, uh, the more intense the imposter syndrome feelings can become. Because uh, even though you're you feel and and this was again, I, I know that it's lunchtime and all. Uh, I'll be giving a 50 minute t long talk about this at at Besides Charm in April. But one of the things that happens is that uh, for those of you that have been in an industry for a while. 
uh, you'll recognize the fact that when you got in the industry, you're like, yeah, I know everything there is to know. But once you get in there and you start learning, there's this, holy shit, I had no idea that all this deeper stuff was there. My kids uh, are in high school, and uh, they, they came home, my, my son's like, man, this biology stuff is so simple. You know, we're learning about osmosis and mitosis and stuff. I was like, that's really cool, son. Have you gotten to uh, the part about deoxyribonucleic acid? He's like, oh yeah, DNA, I got that. I'm like, well, what are the different parts of it? And he told me, and I said, well, well, okay, those proteins, well, what, describe how those are made. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, go deeper. How many atoms are there? And how do they know where to go? And how do they know how to combine it? He's like, stop, dad, stop. But yeah, the deeper you go, the more you learn, the more likely you are to become to feel the imposter feeling syndrome because um, because you realize all the stuff that you don't know. Yes, sir, in the back, and then uh, we'll we'll go ahead and break. Yes, sir. And we're done. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. Thank you. And for those of you on the video, Joe just totally reinforced my imposter syndrome feelings. So, uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. And please help yourself to free food. I'll be up here if you want to talk. Thanks.